Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Medical Debt and Racial Justice, a conversation between Luke Messick and Kenyon Farrow. My name is Tamara Knapper, and I am a co-organizer of this event with Carlos Enriquez, um, who is, <clears throat> excuse me, Haymarket's programming and events organizer. I want to thank Carlos um, for all of their work on this. I also want to thank Sean Larson, who I reached out to about organizing this. Um, and this is, I think, my fifth event with Haymarket, so I also want to thank Haymarket. Um, and I also just want to thank quickly Amanda Lundberg, who will be providing the live closed captioning. So, medical debt and racial justice. Audre Lorde is often talked about as a proponent of self-care. Her famous words, quote, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare, are published in her book, A Burst of Light. The book contains a journal entry from November 8, 1986. On this day, Audre Lorde wrote, I saw the specialist in liver tumors at a leading cancer hospital in New York City, where I'd been referred as an outpatient by my own doctor. The first people who interviewed me in white coats from behind a computer were only interested in my healthcare benefits and proposed method of payment. Those crucial facts determine what kind of plastic ID card I would be given. And without a plastic ID card, no one at all was allowed upstairs to see any doctor, as I was told by the uniformed pistol guards at all the stairwells. The politics of navigating healthcare systems and its cost is a topic that many committed to racial justice have addressed, including W.E.B. Du Bois, the Black Panther Party, and one of the Black Panther Party's key organizers, Fred Hampton. In a 1969 speech delivered at Northern Illinois University, Hampton talked about the Black Panther, Party, Black Panther Party's People's Free Medical Clinic opened in Chicago's West Side. He explained its location. He said it was, quote, because we know where the problem is at. We know that black people are most oppressed. This clinic served everyone. As Fred Hampton said, the only prerequisite is to receive free medical care is prerequisite that you be sick. And so this is something that we're gonna be thinking about tonight, the kind of cost of care, but also who's most likely to be impacted by this cost of care. But we're gonna also think about how racial politics inform kind of the design of healthcare systems and the cost to everybody in the society. As Toni Morrison said, quote, no policy decision could be understood without the black topic at its center, even or especially when unmentioned, not housing, not education, the military, economy, voting, citizenship, prisons, loan practices, healthcare, name it. The real subject was what to do with black people, which became a substitute term for poor people. Tonight, we'll explore the issues raised by Lord Hampton Morrison and others to consider the state of US healthcare and the ongoing crisis of medical debt and how addressing these issues are connected to racial justice. We are joined by two experts and advocates who can help us navigate through this current crisis, Luke Messick and Kenyon Farrow. Before, we, uh, before I introduce them, <clears throat> I just wanna note that the issues of healthcare infrastructure and healthcare policy are being put front and center by what is happening in Gaza and to Palestinians there. <clears throat> Um, sorry, I have no words to describe the horror of what is happening there in terms of why people are being rushed and seeking refuge in the hospitals. And I have no words to describe the care and commitment being shown by brave healthcare workers and all of those who are becoming essential workers of some type, whether it's digging through the rubble, rescuing neighbors and strangers and trying to help themselves and others survive the slaughter. Sorry. So let me now introduce our two uh, uh, speakers, Kenyon Farrow and Luke Messick. Kenyon Farrow is a writer, editor, and strategist whose work has long focused on public health and infectious disease with a focus on racial, gender, and economic justice. He is the vice president of policy with Point Source Youth, a national organization working to end youth homelessness. He is the former managing director of advocacy and organizing with Prep for All, and also served as senior editor of thebody.com and thebodypro.com, and US and global health policy director with Treatment Action Group, TAG. 
He currently serves on the boards of the LGBT Center of Greater Cleveland and New York Transgender Advocacy Group. Luke Messick is an emergency physician and a historian. He is an attending physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital and an instructor in emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. He received his BA from Harvard University, his MD and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, and completed residency training in emergency medicine at Brown Rhode Island Hospital. His research focuses on the history and political economy of healthcare, as well as on diagnostics for emergency care in resource limited settings. And his first book, No More to Spend, is a history of medical neglect and exploitation in Malawi. His latest book, his newest book, um, which will be part of the uh, centerpiece of the conversation between uh, Luke and Kenyon, is um, Your Money or Your Life, Debt Collection in American Medicine. Um, and it came out this month um, on Oxford University Press. So uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you Haymarket Books for um, uh, hosting this. And thank you, Luke and Kenyon, for what I know will be a very informative conversation. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Tamara, for the introduction. And thank you to Haymarket and to uh, Carlos and Amanda also for helping support uh, this event. Uh, so I'm just going to do, before I uh, get into my questions, just so people know what, <laughs> what the book looks like, uh, to... Uh, Take a look at it and uh, and to purchase uh, after this conversation if you don't already have it. Um, so, Luke, uh, first I just want to say congratulations on the publication of the book. And you know, having read it, um, I have to say not only is it like full of great like information, but um, it's also good writing. Like it's such good writing. <laughs> to, Thanks, you know, Kenyon. To cover these kinds of uh, you know kind of complicated issues, you know, in terms of talking about healthcare, it's hard to pull off. So um, I just want to commend you for that. Uh, number one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and um, so to get into the discussion, you know, you really lay out a clear history of how medical debt isn't a new phenomena, right? Although it, it feels like it's been a lot in the news in the last, you know, kind of. 15 years or so, 10 or 15 years, particularly since the, you know, kind of um, start of the Affordable Care Act or the sort of battles around uh, that piece of legislation. Um, but as our healthcare system has become more institutionalized and more specialized and frankly more privatized, medical debt has become more and more a feature of just modern life, uh, particularly in the U.S., but not exclusively in the U.S. Um, so first, I just want you to talk about the history of medical care and costs and when those costs couldn't be paid uh debt yeah absolutely yeah thanks so much for having me kenyan thank you so much for having this conversation with me thank you haymarket for doing this um thanks tamara uh yeah really excited to be with you so so let's get started so yeah so imagine you can't pay a bill for medical debt and it's 1886 right you you happen to find a, a physician to take care of you uh that physician might uh, might negotiate with you personally about whether you're going to be able to pay that pay that debt. They will, the, you know, present the bill to you either on a quarterly or yearly basis. And if you can't pay it, then you have to decide uh, as a physician what you're going to do. Are you going to continue the relationship and just allow them to pay later? Are you going to decrease the bill? Are you going to put them on a payment plan? Are you going to stop taking care of them until they pay your bill? Uh, are you going to stop taking care of the whole family? Uh, these are some of the decisions that physicians had to make um, in every community in the United States in uh, in that era, when physicians were tasked with the with the actual billing of their patients. Right? These were these were personal negotiations. In hospitals, uh, you know, black hospitals, white hospitals, integrated hospitals, such as there were. You had you had a, a kind of different situation. Uh, the hospitals until the early 20th century were largely places for the poor. Like they were they were ex almost explicitly places for the poor. If you had means, you did not go to these places. These were these were institutions uh, from in the almshouse tradition, right? These are places where you would go if you had no other place to go. Um, the care on offer there was not always great, but uh, if you were deemed worthy enough and uh, indigent enough for care in a hospital, you would seek your care there. And sometimes the care was free. Sometimes you'd be made to do some sort of work to pay off uh, the the cost of your care. Uh, but it still was a place where the idea of payment was still a little foreign. 
Uh, that started to change in the early 20th century uh, in when hospitals started to draw in more paying patients. They were places where you could now get surgery. They had antisepsis. They were places where um, more people were seeking care and more physicians were looking to work. And so the, uh, the debt collection process came to be kind of an in-house feature of the hospital. The hospital would send out bills. It would have its own billing and collections departments. Uh, very frequently, people couldn't afford the care, right? So they would have to decide what to do with the bills. And very often, they would leave these debts on their books for years, even decades, right? This wasn't some halcyon perfect era. Plenty of people were in debt. Plenty of people were driven to desperation by debt. But it was still, it was still a clinical bond between patient and their medical provider between the doctor and the nurse and the hospital taking care of them. These were, you know, hospitals were built by religious institutions, by ethnic associations, by uh, local philanthropists. And so like this, this was, this was an intensely local relationship and hospitals were, were reluctant to be too aggressive because they were, they were built on the foundation of this local trust. We'll talk about how that changed, but that was kind of the, the, the basis of this, of this relationship. Yeah, thank you. And so, you know, as Tamara mentioned kind of in the beginning um, that, you know, there's a kind of a, a feature of talking about the social safety net in the United States that, you know, uh, poverty and the sort of safety safety net programs or to think even about, you know, um, you know, hospitals or indigent care also becomes like very racialized, right, mm -hmm. discourse. And so um, where do you sort of situate that in this early period? Do you see in your research elements of uh, kind of racial discourse and talking about poverty and, and who can and can't pay or who should or shouldn't be, uh, you know, sort of um, gone after for, you know, pay or even frankly criminalized in some cases, right? That, that becomes also a racial conversation as well. Yeah, I mean, the earliest, the earliest era, like the late 19th, early 20th century, I mean, when we're talking about, this is an era of highly segregated care uh, you know, throughout the country. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you have segregated wards on hospitals. Sometimes you have separate hospitals altogether for black and white patients. Um, and physicians themselves, if they were in private practice, had it, it was up to them to decide who they would take care of, um, whether they would take care of white patients, whether they'd take care of black patients, whether they would take care of both. Uh, and, and you don't see all that much discussion explicitly in the literature about uh, who was being who was being taken to court, who was being, uh, you know, pursued aggressively uh, for debts. But there was in general a sense that you, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't always get care to begin with, right? If you weren't, um, if you weren't deemed worthy enough for that care. Uh, there was a, a case in the, there's a case in the thirties when um, a gentleman brought his young daughter to a hospital, uh, white, white, uh, man brought his young daughter to a hospital in, uh, and, and she had diphtheria, which is a, a pretty horrific disease. It basically coats your mouth and your throat in this white film, uh, that slowly suffocates you to death. It's really terrifying. We don't have it anymore because of vaccination, but it does exist elsewhere in the world. And so, uh, he was, he was turned away at the door because the hospital, um, stated that this was a contagious condition and they they reserve the right to decline care to whoever they would would like to uh, would like to he took he she ended up his daughter ended up dying sadly and and he ended up taking the hospital to court and the court said the hospital was in the right that they had any they had any right to deny care to whom whomsoever they wished on whatever whatever basis they wished and so this ended up serving as um as a basis that hospitals would claim to deny care on grounds of race, on grounds of income, even though the initial grounds were were the contagion of the condition, uh, hospitals would use this this logic from this one precedent uh, to justify not taking care of whoever they would like. Thank you. Um, so, you know, moving forward into the 20th century, um, when we really start to see kind of as a result of the uh, various kinds of like public health reforms and then the New Deal and then into the 1960s, the civil rights movement, um, you know, kind of reforms that happen in terms of public health and how, you know, healthcare also is 
uh, administered. Um, and we also, you know, kind of see uh, in that period in the ni- late 1960s when uh, the act is passed that creates Medicaid and Medicare, um, and, you know, creates the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, federally. Um, and those two programs obviously have done a lot to assist poor people and senior citizens have access to free or greatly reduced costs of medical care. But, you know, obviously it didn't exactly solve the problem. So if you could talk about, you know, what happened to the matrix of regulating healthcare costs and payments for people who were on or underinsured uh, during CMS's creation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was this was a tremendous moment, the, the mid 60s, right? The height of the Great Society, the passage of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, Medicare and Medicaid, which are an essential component of civil rights legislation, you know, um, King and others constantly made this point. And so uh, many things changed. You saw a rapid decrease in the percentage of the American public who was uninsured. Uh, and that was that that rate would not be equaled again until after 2014 with Medicaid expansion. So you saw this rapid decrease in the in the rate of uninsurance. Uh, but at the same time, hospitals themselves took this opportunity to kind of back away from their historical obligation as charitable institutions. And they started to argue that now that we have third party private insurance, we have public insurance, we have insurance for the poor, we have insurance for the aged, uh, why would we why would we ever need to provide charity care out of our own pockets? Uh, and so you know they 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 argued successfully to the IRS to change the standard of tax exemption for a charity hospital, for a nonprofit hospital that they no longer had to provide charity care to the extent of their ability, which was the previous standard. And they would they could lose their tax exemption if they didn't do that. Now they only had to uh, provide some level of community benefit. And that that benefit could be very broadly construed. It was very broadly construed. They were allowed to, if they had an open emergency room that anyone could walk into, you weren't guaranteed care once you did, but if you anyone could walk into it. You and, could walk in before, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could walk in, but you might, yeah, you might not get care once you did. You could walk, and they had to take all paying patients, paying patients, right? Pay, people who are insured um, or had money to pay, they had to take them. Uh, that was basically the basis for tax exemption. No longer were they considered charitable institutions. The IRS agreed with them that it was, quote, an anachronism. So Medicare and Medicaid, I don't want to I don't want to give short shrift to. I mean, some folks within the federal government pushed to make sure that Medicare funding was dependent on hospitals desegregating. And so like the fact that hospitals rapidly desegregated in the mid 1960s is a direct result of the passage of Medicare and Medicaid and the subsequent regulations that happened thereafter. But that era also saw this this uh, kind of uh, this this change from at least in federal regulation from the the vision of the hospital as a charitable institution to one that was largely a business and that that interpretation has persisted. What role do you see uh, some of the kind of associations? Um, so, for instance, the American Medical Association, which you know a lot of people think of the those kinds of associations as fairly benevolent, you know, but but, you know, you and I both know that the AMA has also been historically involved in some of the most conservative uh, lobbying around uh, health care. And so what role was the AMA playing uh, at this particular juncture, right, in the 60s as, uh, you know, changes in, in the kind of health care payment infrastructure, Medicare, Medicaid, and then, you know, the private market, you know, was there? What, what role were the AMA or other associations sort of playing at this time? It's been a while since I've heard anyone call the AMA benevolent. Uh, <laughs> they'd be happy to hear you say that, but I don't. Yeah, we we I don't know, know that. They earned it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, this was the AMA, the American Medical Association, the largest association of physicians in the in the United States. Although one to which many physicians do not any longer belong. I, I never, I never did, it, and I never will. But um, the they were adamant opponents of Medicare from the start. They. Uh, they organized against it. So in the early 1960s, there was this bill uh, by a congressman in Rhode Island named M.F. Ferrand who put forward basically what would become Medicare. Um, and he, 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 uh, he earned the, uh, he earned the ire of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was then an actor, not, not yet the governor of California or, um, 
or the president of the United States. But at that time, he was hired by the American Medical Association to put together this this uh, disc, this this recording that would be handed out at like coffee clutches around the country to, you know, to to suburban homes across the country. And there he he railed against Medicare as socialized medicine. He said that, you know, if we don't stop this one day, we will tell our children and our children's children what America was like when men were free, right? That was the kind of language that they were using <laughs> to argue against Medicare. Medicare passed, um, you know, Johnson and, and the administration and Congress were able to pass it and it became one of the most popular programs in America. And to say that stuff about uh, Medicare now would, <laughs> would definitely not win you votes. But, you know, you got to know that at the time they were adamantly against it. The hist history of organized medicine and the AMA in particular is a history of vocal, consistent opposition to uh, national health insurance, to single payer. Um, fortunately, we're starting to see that change a little bit. Uh, we're seeing some of the larger medical societies come out either saying they're no longer going to oppose uh, single payer or they're in favor of single payer. The AMA is not yet one of them, but there are some changes afoot. Uh, one more note is that the American Hospital Association, like very powerful then and now, and they um, they were some of the folks pushing for uh, pushing for this change in the law about what what earned you a tax exemption, right? So they maybe not so vocal in their opposition to Medicare and Medicaid, it did garner them some additional funding, but they wanted to make sure that they were not going to be tasked with the care of the uninsured, uh, that that wasn't going to be something that they were held responsible for. Yeah. So, you know, you said a couple of things there that are interesting to me that, you know, one, the role that Ronald Reagan played in, uh, you know, trying to, you know, undermine, uh, you know, the passing of the, uh, you know, Medicaid and Medicare, um, you know, the bill that created those two programs. Um, and then we obviously see Ronald Reagan become governor of California and um, actually initiates one of the first uh, tries to reform uh, or ultimately gut welfare as we know it, right? Mm -hmm. the, in fact, what happened in the 1990s in the Clinton administration was actually in some ways the model that Ronald Reagan wanted to pass uh, in California, and which Nixon, if I'm not mistaken, opposed, right, um, mm. at the time. But but so by the time, you know, Medicare, Medicaid is passed and we get into the um, post-civil rights era, um, we see that the public insurance programs, right, and the safety net programs overall are beginning to be stigmatized and, and, and racialized, right, in the, the public discourse. Um, and as you just mentioned, you know, hospitals beginning to deny care to, uh, you know, poor people um, and particularly uh, force poor and black folks into um, public hospitals that were often underfunded and overwhelmed, right, in terms of dealing with uh, the kinds of uh, uh, the capacity to deal with those the kind of health care issues uh, in communities. So one of the things that sounds like you're saying in the book uh, is that the increasingly hostile increasing hostility to poor and black people by hospitals and healthcare establishments is in a way a, a kind of backlash to the civil rights movement, right? Um, so I just want you to say more about that. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, the, the era of expansion of insurance under Medicare and Medicaid did spawn a backlash. And like you said, Ronald Reagan was a huge part of that. During the 70s, when he was first running for president, he was running on the idea of welfare queens living large off the public dole. In the 80s, when he presided over some of the uh, restrictions in Medicaid eligibility uh, and declining reimbursements for Medicare and Medicaid patients, uh, he said that the whole point was to make sure that no one was taking advantage of the system. And that, you know, the heavily racialized language throughout. Uh, and that really did cause massive amounts of pain. I mean, in the 70s, you'd already seen waves of public hospital for uh, public hospital closures. And so the places where folks would go if they didn't have means to pay were became less and less available. In the 80s, you saw a continued decline in the number of hospitals in the places where people could go. The number of hospitals decreased by almost 10% during the 1980s, in part because it became much harder to fund hospitals, safety net hospitals with Medicare and Medicaid patients. They just weren't 
paying the costs of care. So one of the that 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 was a huge spur towards hospitals to turn towards more aggressive debt collection as well. This is where like debt collection comes into the picture again because hospitals weren't making as much money off the paying patients. They looked at their non-paying patients or their self-pay patients as they called them. They said, we got to get more from these folks. And at the same time, they were being approached by debt collection agencies who promised them, promised them that they could help make good on those payments. They said, your, your job is not to approach these individuals and ask them for money. That's not what you guys are good at, right? Hospitals agreed. They're, they, their billing and collection departments were built to deal with insurance companies. They want to fight with insurance over adequate reimbursement. That's what, they're, that's what they do every day. They don't want to make individual collections phone calls or lawsuits, but they ended up hiring out these third-party collection agencies because the promise was that they would do it for them. Uh, so that was a, a huge, like a huge moment. The 1980s, the the retrenchment in public spending, the austerity that led hospitals into financial distress, did precipitate, help precipitate this turn towards more aggressive collection. Yeah, you know, I often think about, uh, you know, just my own kind of memories of, you know, growing up here in Cleveland, Ohio, um, in the 1980s, and. Um, you know, just hearing the adults around me, and this has happened to me actually in other places, every other city I've lived in in the United States, Black people have a very sophisticated kind of analysis of the local healthcare infrastructure, because yeah. people will tell you, uh, oh, if you go here, and in Cleveland, the story was Cleveland Clinic, right, which is internationally known, ranked in the top five medical institutions for care and for research in the world, right? People come all over the world here for Cleveland Clinic care. And yet the black community in Cleveland by and large, um, you know, still to this day actually, but but certainly in the 1980s when I was a kid, um, you know, said, well, you know, if you go to Cleveland Clinic and you are on Medicaid or you don't have insurance, they are gonna wheel your ass, you know, right out the door and you're gonna have to go to uh, you know Metro Health, which is our county uh, public hospital system, or St. Vincent's Charity, right, which is the, the the charity hospital here in town. So, and that was the you know kind of way people understood you know what to tell people about you know how care was being um, held and administered in various places based on you know poverty, and even Cleveland Clinic is situated now in a very poor neighborhood, right? When you go mm -hmm. to the streets just north and south of where the clinic campus is, it's, you know, one of the poorest neighborhoods in the in the, in the the city. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about, and the other thing I just want to say too about the 80s, so this is, this is all happening where hospitals are getting more and more power to turn away patients, yep. um, also at the beginning of the AIDS crisis, right, which we also yep. know from the various oral histories and things that existed. This was happening to you know, um, people dying of AIDS, right? Which, you know, both, you know, so race, poverty, homophobia, transphobia, et cetera, right? Like all kind of mixed in in, in the mix there. Um, but there was a, uh, you know, a, a kind of a policy effort at the time to try to curtail, you know, what we refer to as like medical dumping, right? This like, you know, just sending people to whatever the, you know, what was considered either the charity or the, you know, public hospital or, or clinics in town. Um, uh, and I wrote down in, in Talat, I forgot to write down the full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you could help me out and talk about that act and what it was ultimately trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, those those judgments, that local knowledge about where you would be welcome and where you would not be welcome, they were well-founded. That, that People aren't making that stuff up. That's real. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the early 1980s, we talked about some of the retrenchment in Medicare and Medicaid, um, and that spurred some real increase in this practice of patient dumping. Patient dumping, also known as economic transfers, was a practice whereby you walk into the emergency room or you walk into the hospital and you have what's called a wallet biopsy done. They ask you for your insurance or they ask you how you're going to pay. If you can't produce evidence that you will pay or that you have insurance that will pay, then you are transferred prior to stabilization to the public hospital. So you're tra transferred from the private hospital, even a nonprofit private hospital to a public hospital. This was a phenomenon that people were seeing all across 
happened with right cuts to Medicaid in Chicago started tripling that summer, 1981. A few years later, people were writing about it in California. Uh, and the studies that were done on it were just really, really damning. They, they were transferring hundreds of patients every month, never for a medical reason, and sometimes explicitly saying, because, you know, no insurance. Problem with this, many problems with this. One, you should treat the patient in front of you. Second, is that they, they were transferring patients in active labor, they were transferring patients who were hemorrhaging to death. They were transferring patients who were actively septic, who were sick. These are not patients who are stable for transport. I work in the emergency room, right? Like our, our whole goal is diagnosing and treating people as quickly as possible because we know that minutes count. Minutes count in a heart attack, minutes count in infection, minutes count in stroke. You lose those minutes, you're never gonna get that patient back to where you wanna get them. So the idea of transferring them prior to stabilization is just medically, um, horrific, to be honest. So it was happening all over the country. Eventually, a story came out about Eugene Barnes, a 32-year-old black man who had been stabbed and sought care at a hospital in Oakland and was denied care and ended up dying. And he helped, his his cause, his, his story helped spur local activism. And then uh, Pete Stark, who is the Democrat from California, who represented the Oakland area, wrote the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, EMTALA, which was rolled into an omnibus bill and then signed by Reagan uh, in 86. This was a big deal. It says that hospitals have to treat and stabilize you prior to transfer and that that transfer has to be justified on some medical grounds. We still live with that today. That's something I have to do every time I transfer a patient. I need a form to, to justify why I'm doing it. It's a good thing. Only thing is it didn't come with any funding. It didn't, it was an unfunded mandate. And so it left hospitals with more of an obligation to patients, one that was direly needed, but one that didn't help them to fulfill that mandate. And as a result, debt collection, once again, reared its ugly head. Uh, you know, if we can't collect, if we can't keep them from coming in, then we have to collect on the way out and we have to do it uh, sometimes as aggressively as possible. Thank you. So uh, you're going to get to the, the debt collection, but trying to, you know, kind of lay out the yeah. system issues that would like lead lead to to debt here. Um, so we talked a lot about the public programs, right, and to Medicaid, Medicare, and kind of some of the regulatory changes that, you know, happened that, um, uh, and the backlash of those programs that impacted, you know, care and, you know, continue to squeeze, you know, poor folks. Uh, in such ways that care became less accessible and therefore they would have to, uh, they would owe more more debt when they were able to seek care. Um, so I wanna talk for a second about the, the uh, private market, right? Which um, we haven't really talked much about. So, you know, at this time in the 1980s there's also this kind of shift in the private market where we see the rise of HMOs and managed care plans to cut costs primarily for employers um, who carry health insurance plans for workers. So how do these changes in the private market, you know, um, we're talking not just about, you know, kind of, you know, poor and maybe unemployed or indigent folks, but folks who are are working, you know, working class folks, um, you know, who then are expected to pay more out of pocket and their, their kind of options in terms of what, what care, where they could go, whatever, get kind of, um, shifts because of like the the private market in terms of HMOs and managed care plans. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. I mean, this is really a story of political economy, right? Where where do where do hospitals and pay, and providers get the money when patients seek care? So when Medicare and Medicaid patients went down in the 80s, hospitals relied on those private insured patients to make up the difference, right? The, the cost of care is here. Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement is here. So they build privately insured patients up here more than the cost of care to try to make up the difference. That worked for about a decade. In the 90s, you see this massive turn towards managed care, uh, especially in the private market. It goes like from 90-10 not managed to 90-10 managed, like in the course of a, of a decade, everyone's on HMOs. Uh, and they, they are really cranking down those reimbursements. They're cutting the reimbursements uh, and, pay and paying the hospitals less. Then you have the decade later is people, there's a real backlash against HMOs, right? You have significantly constrained networks. People are getting billed every time, massive bills every time they leave those networks. Um, and, and people are, you know, having, have to, having to leave their doctor as a result, all sorts of backlash, even among like middle and upper middle class folks to those plans. 
So then, then there's the turn towards high deductible health insurance. And the, the idea there is that you can, you can get all these folks enrolled and paying premiums and um, making a bunch of money for insurance companies, but they're not really protected. They still have these huge co-payments and deductibles. So every time they seek care, they're, they're massively exposed to catastrophic costs, even with insurance. So that became increasingly popular. And we're still living in that era today of high deductible health insurance plans. They're on the marketplace, right? There a lot of the plans that we're picking have these massive deductibles. And so, you know, Elizabeth Warren, others who've studied bankruptcy in uh, the United States have found that a huge portion of the people declaring bankruptcy from medical costs have health insurance. They have health insurance. It's just not, it's not good health insurance. And like the idea of good health insurance is like a fading, you know, a fading idea because very few people are adequately protected once they are insured. Thanks. So, um, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about the infrastructure that starts to get created in the 1990s really um, to collect debt, right? So you have, um, you know, one, the role of kind of debt collection agencies, like companies that um, are supposed to be, you know, collecting debt and the things that we start to see, you know, really much more rolled out in the, the 90s in terms of just the expansion of, of those kinds of companies. Um, but then also you see the financial services. So in the 1990s, we also have around this time Congress under the Clinton administration deregulating many aspects of the financial services industry and you know giving rise to you know hedge funds and these big investment groups that are you know buying up debt right which a, a lot of us reference the 2008 financial crisis as the end result of right or one of the yeah. crisis in that that system but but medical debt was also a part of that you know where where debt becomes profitable if you will and so if you could talk a little bit about you know, that, you know, the the kind of rise of, of debt as profit, right, in the sort of, you know, global capitalism. And then uh, also talk about just the role of debt collection, right, in, as a, a a part of the economy, right, in, in, as a sense. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize how huge it was, but medical debt is a huge portion of the business of debt collectors. Debt collectors seek to collect all sorts of consumer debt, you know, your car loans, your your mortgage, all sorts of stuff. But but they they really do rely heavily on medical debt, some more than others. But there's two there's two parts of medical debt that's probably worth mentioning. One is that it it can be it can be collected in one of two ways. It can be collected on an, what's called um, an assignment basis. So it can be on a contingency basis. So the medical debt is assigned from the hospital to the debt collector. They will work to collect it for a period of time, maybe a year. They'll collect as much as they can, and then they'll keep a portion of that, like a commission, uh, maybe 40% at one time. It's gone down over the years. Uh, but they would keep some portion of it and then send the rest back to the hospital after that period is over. A hospital can also sell debt outright. They can say, you know what? We don't want to have anything to do with this debt anymore. We just want to make what we can off of it. So they'll sell this debt, often for pennies on the dollar, to a third party, to a debt buyer, to a debt collector, who will then collect it as as well as they can and keep anything that they do collect from the individuals, from the patients. And so therefore, the, the, the debt is no longer held by the hospital. It's held by that debt collector. So there's two ways to do that. Now, so the first way, the assignment basis, that was much more common, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s. That was kind of the way it was done. Debt buying wasn't as common. It started to be more common starting in the 1990s. There were there were some efforts to do this. So, um, uh uh, the subsidiary of the principal financial group, uh, you know, large insurer, they they started to offer to auction debt from hospitals to a network of debt collectors, and so you know some some debt collectors started buying from hospital systems. This was kind of the beginnings of the the secondary market in medical debt. It would really blossom starting in the 2000s, uh, just before the financial crisis, actually. Uh, Everyone was getting in on the action. Uh, Cargill, you know, the Minnesota conglomerate best known for like grain dealing, they were buying billions of dollars in medical debt. Uh, there was this company that had been started, NCO Financial, had been started out of a, a garage in outside of Philadelphia, uh, and 
the the guy who started it, Michael Barrister, who bought it from his mother and built it into this huge conglomerate on the on the basis of medical debt collection, uh, eventually had 8,000 debt collectors. Uh, 2,000 of them were devoted to medical debt um, at call centers around the world, Caribbean, Philippines, U.S., um, and they were collecting medical debt uh, and through some pretty aggressive means. So this was big business. This is big business. Um, some of these companies are now owned by private equity. Uh, but yeah, the, like you said, the 90s are this era when debt becomes more systematized, more marketized, more financialized. It becomes much more, much easier to buy and sell it. And some of the innovations in medical debt were really to take it from kind of a personal relationship between doctor and patient, or at least between doctor and patient and a third party debt collector who they had a, uh, the hospital had some relationship with to this idea of a financial instrument where the debt could just be bought and sold on, on private markets. Thank you. So, uh, so this brings us up to the uh, Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, right? And a lot of what you've described is, in some ways, some of the background context why the Obama administration, a that that became such a big healthcare became such a big issue in the 2008 campaign, um, particularly between in the debates between Hillary Clinton and, and uh, Barack Obama. Uh, and then we get to, you know, kind of the passage of the act in, in Congress. So if you could talk a little bit more about the ACA and specifically how um, any debates about, you know, kind of medical debt uh, happened in terms of and, and medical and frankly, just the cost of health care in terms of the, the making of the bill and, you know, what we <laughs> I, you know, it's that kind of that meme that people do all the time, which is like what we what we order versus what we got. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so with the ACA, if you could talk about that from the vantage point of like costs and of care and debt, like what we ordered versus what we got. Yeah, I mean, the two thousands were an era when we collectively realized kind of what uh, you know load of garbage we were being given with with our health financing. I mean the. Uh, the Wall Street Journal ran this story in 2003 about this guy named Quentin White, a black 77-year-old former dry cleaning worker in New Haven, Connecticut, who'd been paying back the debt of his deceased wife uh, in a hospitalization she'd had 20 years earlier. He'd been paying it back for 20 years. He'd paid back his initial principal of $16,000, but he still owed $40,000 due to 10% interest and late charges. He'd had his uh, home was had a lien put on it by the hospital. He had his bank account seized, and he still was paying this debt even into his 70s, uh, and had no hope of ever repaying it. So this was um, this was an issue that had reached the public for the Wall Street Journal was doing uh, articles about it. The Congress had started to have hearings about it. Um, there were even class action lawsuits against hospitals for not doing enough for charity care. But they were still, you know, there there was not much protection in the law for folks in medical debt, and there was still a huge portion of the population who was uninsured. So one of the things the ACA did was it expanded Medicaid eligibility so that people around the country were supposed to uh, be eligible for Medicaid up to 133% of the federal poverty level. It's like $40,000 for a family of four currently. Uh, and then above that, up to 400% of the federal poverty level, they were going to get subsidies to help pay for it if they didn't get outright Medicaid coverage. That didn't happen. The The Supreme Court ruled in the Sebelius decision in 2012, Justice John Roberts wrote this decision stating that the, the individual mandate portion of the Affordable Care Act, the one that was like the subject of all the controversy that we heard about in the news, that was legal. Yeah. That was constitutional. But the part of the Medicaid expansion that said it was going to be nationwide, that was unconstitutional. States had a right to refuse it. So even though it was funded 90% by the federal government, states could refuse it. Now, this is where race enters the picture again, unavoidably in the analysis, because almost all the states that ended up declining it, I mean, initially there were about half the states that declined it, and they were the, the red states, as you might imagine. The ones that have still declined it, the ones that still have an expanded Medicaid and still have very restrictive Medicaid eligibility requirements are almost all in the former confe Confederacy, right? It's like all the states with this overt history of prolonged racial discrimination and large black populations. Those are the ones where 
it's still very hard to get Medicaid and hospitals are struggling as a result. And usually the argument that's put forward for, for expansion and the argument that succeeds is that, you know, this is hurting everybody, right? Like it's shutting down hospitals, it's hurting doctors, it's hurting patients, it's hurting local communities, it's hurting economies. And so like they try to move it away from the race argument because they know that's a tough one to win uh, in those places. And But they they will argue, you know, advocates will argue that, that this is hurting everybody. And so it is like, you know, uh, it really is an exercise in, in uh, shooting yourself in the foot, but it it has succeeded in some places, but still about 10 states have not expanded Medicaid and Medicaid eligibility is still very tough in those places. Yeah, thank you for that. And just to say one of the the, the impacts of that has been, uh, so the only two Southern states that have expanded, I think, I think North Carolina is on its way, but um, yeah. Arkansas and Louisiana and, you know, coming from my vantage point, doing a lot of public health and HIV work. So Louisiana, Baton Rouge and New Orleans for 20 years would, split between number one and number two HIV diagnoses in the countries as far as cities were concerned. And the minute that Louisiana expanded Medicaid, um, the rates of HIV started to drop in the state completely attributed to Medicaid expansion. That's wow. period. In the South, it is all, it just in general, uh, the place where about half of, of HIV diagnoses um, still still happen. So it, it, yeah, it had like major impacts. Um, mm. So thank you. So I want to focus yeah. on kind of the, you know, the, the impacts of, of this uh, before we turn it over and look at some questions from the audience. Um, so, you know, one, I want to ask you about, so as we've kind of seen that, you know, the ways in which uh, medical debt has played out both kind of historically ways in which uh, even the reforms, you know, to create, you know, Medicaid and Medicare, sort of public, uh, you know, public health insurance, um, and then the expansion even of the Affordable Care Act, right, even for the private market and, and creating more coverage through Medicaid, at least in places that accepted it. Um, that, that medical debt is still uh, very much a problem in the United States. And, you know, I often think about um, that issue and some of the things that we've seen in the last roughly 10 years where of the kind of rise of the wellness industry or, mm -hmm. you know, the, the goop industrial complex, as I would call it. <laughs> these, like, you know, all these different, you know, kind of boutique brands of, you know, selling, whether they be supplements or a range of, uh, you know, products that are supposed to, you know, because the FDA doesn't really regulate a lot of these things uh, as they should, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but they, you know, people can put out products to make all sorts of healthcare claims. Um, and so I wonder if, in your thinking, is there some correlation between dissatisfaction and disillusionment with the healthcare system because of the cost and debt and lack of access to coverage and you know the, these these other other sort of things um and the, the rise of this industry which i think has also been connected to some of the uh uh vaccine conspiracy theories that we often think about just in terms of black folks from the Tuskegee yeah. system studying of the and but we you know a lot of suburban white ladies in the 1990s you know started with a lot of the you know childhood vaccinations cause mm -hmm. autism kind of stuff that yeah. that had an impact on on covid right and and our you know ability to roll out covid vaccines so i'm curious about that right like how you see the um public sort of relationship to medical care as a profit-driven enterprise, right, and not really care um, as much, um, and these other sort of dynamics around the, the growth of an interest in these sort of like wellness products and the kind of wellness industry and then the, 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 the medical mistrust and, and, and conspiracy theories that we also deal with. Yeah. You know, that's 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 so true. I mean, so much of med medical care is premised on a foundation of trust, right? We're we are as physicians and nurses, you know, we, we are the people you see when you are the most vulnerable, when you are the most in pain, when you are the most uncertain about what's going to happen to your very body. And the 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 language we're taught as physicians, the history of of this this obligation as physicians is one of like a, a sacred trust. And yet 
you you open up the pages of any any you know um, uh, health finance management association journal or and, and even like the newspaper and you see that really the language of medicine is the language of like clients and consumers right we're not talking about these like sacred bonds that we have to hold true at, at all costs like it's it's no there are costs and if you don't pay them you will be denied uh, so people are denied care people are taken to court people are um uh people are people are uh, even put in jail if they if they can't pay their bills and don't show up for their court dates uh so that for good reason that would tarnish trust that would tarnish relationships premised on trust we already we already know that actually nurses are one of the most still the most trusted professions in the united states physicians are underneath that still about like 70 percent of americans say they trust physicians uh but hospital administrators, it's like 22%. It's like not, no one trusts hospital administrators, right? They know what they, they, they suspect their motives might not be pure. And maybe that's not fair to every hospital administrator, but that is the kind of distrust that we risk falling into if we accept that language as, as you know, the way things are, the way things have to be. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, right when COVID hit, I wrote this piece in my local newspaper about how we were going to fail uh, to vaccinate the population if we didn't establish relationships built on trust. And a lot of that had to do with material provision to make sure that everyone had access to care, that everyone had access to, um, uh, to material supports. And, you know, our failure to do that, our failure to do that on a wide basis uh, has, has helped spur uh, some, of the, uh, some of the distrust, some of the hesitancy around vaccination. As I think it, like you said, spurred the like wellness industrial complex, we, if we don't have an answer for you, or if you won't, you don't have access to that answer, then you have to turn somewhere, right? Like I, I tell people when they come in for cough that we don't have like a great solution for like a cough necessarily. There's not like a, a perfect medicine for a cough. And so basically that's why when you go to CVS, there's like 20 cough medicines because none of them are perfect. And no one, you know, maybe some of them work for some people, some of them work for others, but like without a good answer, it just spurs this this proliferation of like half measures, and so I think that's what we risk risk doing for the entire entirety of medicine. Like we have some great answers. I still believe in biomedicine. We have amazing cures. We have amazing treatments, um, but we we ration them by income, uh, and that that leads to profound and merited distrust. So to my last question, uh, you just kind of leaned into it a little bit more. So, um, you know. From your vantage point as a physician, you know, what is your vision, right, as a way to transform the system to lead to a health care system that's not driven by profit and profiteering? Yeah, I think single payer is a huge part of this answer, right? It's not it's not going to solve every problem, but it is going to solve many problems. We have a system right now that's built around a whole bunch of rentiers, right? A lot of middlemen making money off the system without providing much in the way of care. Uh, health insurance companies, you know, brand name drug companies that really profit off a lot of publicly funded research uh, for private gain. Um, pharmacy benefit managers, uh, you know, now we have private equity companies. It's 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 a whole bunch of folks who are making a whole lot of money without providing providing care or helping to provide care. In fact, they're often keeping people from it. So I think single payer will cut out some of those middlemen, particularly the insurance companies. Uh, we don't need them. We've, we've, you know, we have examples from around the world of countries that work much better without them. Uh, but we also need, you know, we, we need that, we need that to be a specific kind of single payer system. Like you can't, you can't just, you know, privatize it through managed care and call it call it Medicare for all, right? Like even Medicare now is significantly privatized and privatized. starting Medicaid. to yeah. Medicaid too through managed care organizations through causing significant waste and, uh, and difficulty with people accessing care. You know, they're, they're taking things off the formulary there, you know, there's so many people glomming onto the healthcare system because it's so, there's so much money in it um, and taking their little piece. So we got to make sure that if we're going to build a single payer system, that it's truly single payer and truly publicly financed, um, and without, you know, without the realm of all these middlemen, there are some things going on right now that are 
helping to move us in the right direction. I think people ad- agitating and act, uh, advocating for Medicaid expansion in the places where it doesn't exist, they are doing good work that is completely necessary and we have to support that. Uh, people who are helping to make medical debt collection less aggressive, at least, um, are doing good work. There's a move in Maryland uh, that passed some bills over the last couple of years that prevents people from getting arrested as a result of medical debt. Not something I thought I would have to say, but doesn't exist in most places throughout the country, that law. Um, you know, they can't put liens on your homes. They can't sell your debt. Uh, and there's limitations on the um, on the lawsuits that can be filed. So, you know, should people ever be put in legal jeopardy for not being able to pay their bills? No, of course not. That's that's wild. The, the fact that I'm telling my patient that they need to stay overnight because I'm worried they're having a heart attack and they're going home because they're worried that they're going to end up in court six months later. Like, I... You can't provide good care in situations like that. So there are there are reformist measures that we can do right now, uh, but I think looking towards a single payer healthcare system is uh, really the way that we're going to eliminate this problem. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, being able to talk to you and walk through some of these things. Um, so uh, I'm going to move now to some questions uh, from uh, folks watching. And so uh, one of the first questions um, is from Elena, uh, which is, um, there are medical groups buying down, or there are groups, sorry, buying down medical debt. Can you advise which one of these orgs are best to contribute to in order to pay down medical debt or orgs that folks should be paying attention to from an activist perspective? Yeah, there are some great groups doing great work. Uh, this idea of buying and forgiving medical debt was was first thought up by the, the debt collective, or as it was known then, strike debt, this outgrowth of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, folks who've read um, Astra Taylor, David Graeber, uh, they know the work. Um, and that was a pretty, uh, at the time, revolutionary idea that you could buy medical debt and instead of seeking to collect on it, forgive it entirely. It helped expose the, the it helped a lot of us learn about this secondary market for medical debt, that medical debt can be bought and sold and collected on by financiers who have no role in patient care. Um, since then, a lot of the folks who initially started this idea have kind of turned against it, saying that, uh, you know, at least as a, it can't be the last step, certainly. And even as it exists today, it still funds, you know, debt collectors. It's still, you're still paying debt collectors for that debt. And so it perpetuates a system that we really don't want to exist anymore. That said, it does provide people with immediate relief who are in debt. Um, and so there's a group, RIP Medical Debt, that forgives uh, huge tranches of debt. I think they've done $10 billion in medical debt forgiveness. And they also do advocate for systemic uh, solutions, systemic um, solutions to the problem. But I would say there's others as well. Dollar uh, Four is this organization that will help anyone apply for charity care, right? Every hospital that gets a tax exemption is supposed to have financial assistance. They will help anyone apply for that for free, right? So that those onerous forms that are crazy to think that someone who's sick and just got out of the hospital is going to be able to apply for it, uh, they will help you do it. So dollar four, D-O-L-L-A-R-F-O-R is a great organization too. And then the Debt Collective, uh, a great group that started all this in many ways in, in about a decade ago, they're still advocating um, on medical debt. You probably know them best for their work on student debt and helping to convince Biden to uh, propose student debt forgiveness, but they, they've also done a ton of work with medical debt and are doing even more now. So I would say get involved in the debt collective, help out dollar four. If you really want to help buy and forgive medical debt, then RIP Medical Debt is there too. Uh, but there are great groups doing good work. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think uh, we are probably pretty much done. I think that's all the questions that have come in um, from the audience. But uh, I just want to give you an opportunity to, uh, if you want to tell folks uh, where they can uh, find you, if you put you know, things out in the world in addition to books about your <laughs> your analysis of, of, of healthcare uh, systems. So I'll give you an opportunity to name anything you want to uh, put out there. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, so this this book is basically a history of, of medical debt collection. It chronicles some crazy stories, people um, uh, really going through it, but also fighting back against the system. Um, I put out some articles in Jacobin. Uh, you can see articles about uh, organizing in medicine uh, and the history of uh, debt collection. I just wrote an article in The Nation about uh, about organizing in medicine and how the 
the idea of the physician as an independent professional is really fading away and how we become employees of large organizations and really what the physician as an employee means, what, what, how, we, how we can organize best in a system uh, where we really no longer control um, the means of production. Uh, so there's, uh, those, are, those are some of the things, but um, I, I did try to take a turn towards the magazine world. I know Kenyon's been in it for a long time, but um, those are some of the folks some of the things I put out. Great, um, thank you so much. So I uh, just wanna say to folks uh, again, um, to just check out uh, Your Money or Your Life uh, at bookstores everywhere, uh, online and in person. And again, uh, check out Luke's work uh, at any of the other publications uh, that exist. And I wanna just say once again, uh, thank you to uh, Tamron Opera, to Carlos Enriquez, to Amanda Lundberg, and to Haymarket uh, yeah. for constantly, I think, hosting these kinds of conversations, um, you know, with authors to really get to the, um, you know, core of some critical issues uh, happening in our, our country and around the globe. So um, thank you all for your work and uh, we will see you at the next uh, event. Good night. Yeah.